So I was 19 years old. I was spending my summer working at the Alabama Baptist RA camp. Uh, For those of you that may not have grown up, Baptist RAs is like Boy Scouts with Bible verses. Uh, And I was working at the RA camp. Uh, And so my summer was camping, canoeing, uh, leading boys in uh, rock climbing and rappelling and campfires and hatchet throwing and BB guns. And so we enjoyed mosquitoes, uh, a lot of humidity, swimming, ticks, and very few showers, and we might have brushed our teeth every once in a while. It was an exciting time. But also during that summer, I was saving up money for an engagement ring. And one of the weekends nearing the end of the summer, I had piled enough money together that it was time to go shopping for an engagement ring. Now, I, being uh, somewhat of a country boy and working the summer in the camp, switching over into walking to jewelry stores and learning about engagement rings was a big uh, switch for me. I, I was not as versed. I had to go to ring buying school. If you're in the room this morning and you've not bought a diamond ring for a lady, uh, I'm about to give you some straight up gold advice, all right? There are five C's to buying a diamond. You have to know the carat, that's how big. You have to know the cut, that's the style. You have to know the clarity, is it uh, translucent or not. You have to know the color, what kind of color spectrum is in the diamond. And then you need to know if it's certified, meaning it's been proven. This diamond is real and it has a a serial number and it was brought in maybe in an ethical way, not not an unethical way. And so I had to learn about the five C's of shopping for a diamond. But there's a sixth C that's even more important. How much cash did I have? So I go to the Anniston Mall in Anniston, Alabama, where there are, it's a small town, but there's a couple of jewelry stores in the mall, so I begin to move about the mall. And I go into some of the big name chain stores like a K Jewelers and some others, and then I go down to this smaller store, and and I had to figure out what my wife wanted, what kind of cut she wanted, and and I determined that it was the princess cut, which looks like a diamond. Uh, I don't know why they don't call it diamond cut, because we all call it a diamond. They call it princess cut so they can add more money to the price of the diamond, right? So I go into a jewelry store, I find one I like, I look at it, the guy comes out, he brings out this thing where you put up to your eye and you're supposed to look at it, you know, and I don't know what that means, but I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it's, it's pretty. And then I went down to a store around the corner and I found another one that looked just like it and it was 100 bucks cheaper. Yes! But then my, my heart started to worry. What if she found out I bought the 100 bucks cheaper ring? What will this do to the start of our marriage? I mean... We're going to get off on a bad foot right off the bat, right? I wasn't sure which one I liked more. So I bought the one that was cheaper, paid cash, had the money right there on the spot, bought it, made sure of the return policy, went around the corner to the other store with the ring I just bought, and I said, hey, I want to compare this one to the one you had. Looked at them together. The one I didn't buy was the one that was better. The store I was at gave me full price for what I paid for it. I borrowed 100 bucks from my buddy. He's invested in my marriage at that point, right? Borrowed 100 bucks from him so I could cover the difference, bought the ring, and later that fall I proposed to her. And over 21 years later, she gets to be my wife. How lucky is she? Every time, every time, if you are married, you look at your hand, you have a ring on most likely. I have on a ring. I've had several throughout our marriage. This one is just kind of a, a rubber ring. I enjoy this one because I can pull the innards out of a deer and don't worry about it. That's a little more than you wanted to know, didn't it? That's why I enjoy this one, but I, I have a gold one at home as well. But, but every time you look at your hand and you look at your ring, you wash your hands, you take off your ring, you put on some lotion or you put your ring back on. Every time you look at your ring, it is a symbol and a sign of something bigger. That ring that I gave my wife, which by the way, it has been reset in a bigger, fuller with more diamonds because, hey, the jewelry store is going out of business. We have to do it now is what I was told. But every time you look at the ring, you are reminded of a bigger promise, a bigger covenant. It is a sign and a symbol of a ceremony and a commitment and a way of life. 
The ring is the till death do us part. The ring is in better or worse. The ring is what God has put together. Let no man tear apart. The ring is reminding us of something larger than itself. Left alone, it's just a ring. In fact, this one on my finger is less than 15 bucks. It's just a ring. But together with the symbolism With the promise, with the idea of what's behind the ring, there is commitment. There is devotion. There is a symbol. I want to invite you this morning, take out your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. We are working our way through this first book of the Bible. The word Genesis means beginning or origin. It finds its title in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1, that in the beginning, that is origin. That's where we get the word Genesis from. This whole book is telling us about the beginning of the world, the beginning of creation, the beginning of society, the beginning of nations. In this book, we find the introduction of sin. We find the introduction of death. We find the introduction of crime and punishment. We find all the building blocks of the world in this first book. And as we read the book, the first uh, several, the first 11 chapters are kind of fast-paced and big and broad. And, and then in chapter 12, it slows down and starts to focus on one person and one family that will become one nation. Uh, this person is Abram. You'll find this in Genesis chapter 12. God calls Abram and his wife to go into the promised land and begin to build the nation of Israel. The Hebrew people will come from Abram. And in this following of Abram, we will see God make promises to him and what those promises will mean throughout the future and what they mean to us today. The promises given to Abram or Abraham in Genesis are for us as well today. They matter to us today. Thousands of years later, they are important to us. And in Genesis chapter 17... God will again, for the third or fourth time, reiterate his promises to Abram. He will tell Abram exactly what he's going to do for him. He's going to make a covenant with him. He's going to make a declaration of this is the commitment I'm making to you and to the future generations that come from you. God will do that. And in Genesis chapter 17, he will seal it with a sign. He will seal it with a symbol. In just a moment, we will read this and we will see the words covenant and promise and circumcision. Instead of a wedding ring, circumcision of the males will become the sign of this promise. The reminder of what God is promising to Abram. But in Genesis 17, what I hope you will see this morning is that the God of the Bible, the God of creation... The God in whom we gather and worship and serve, the God in whom we proclaim, is a promise-giving, promise-keeping God. He never breaks his word. He is always faithful to do what he says he will do. He is always faithful to accomplish what he declares for us by his grace and his mercy. Have you ever been let down by a promise? Sure you have. Sure you have. You've been promised something and it never happens. We get promised something every four years in this country by whoever's running for the office. And they never fulfill exactly what they said they will do. We get promised as children that we'll get ice cream. And then mama runs out of money, time runs late, the ice cream shop closes, and mama is a wicked liar, right? We promises. They they fall. They break. But what we will see in Genesis 17 is that when God makes a promise, it is sure. It is good. It is going to be fulfilled. Look with me at Genesis 17. We're going to read the first 14 verses together. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make a covenant between you and you and me. And and I may multiply you greatly. Verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. 
No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generation for an everlasting covenant. To God, to you, and to your offsprings after you. And I will give to you and to your offsprings after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Now, verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offsprings, after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant, which I shall keep between me and you and your offsprings after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in his flesh of the foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who, uh, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is at your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in this flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, Lord, we pray you would help us to see what it means to know the God who keeps his promises. Lord, help us to see how the promises that you gave to Abraham thousands of years ago matter to us today. Father, I pray this morning you would help me to, to bridge the gap between this ancient text and the, and the truth for today. Lord, you are a good and wonderful God, and we thank you that you are the God who keeps your promises. Help us to worship you today, Father, through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God, in his divine and wonderful mercy, has established the promise of reconciling the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, this promise finds its first announcement in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the sin of Adam and Eve, God tells Eve that she will have an offspring, meaning one will come from her line, not directly from her, but from her line, and this offspring will crush the serpent's head, the serpent being Satan. This is a prophecy of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we have the first prophecy that Jesus will come and destroy Satan, get rid of sin, and make everything right. Again, reestablishing, if you will, the Garden of Eden. So from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the rest of the Bible, God is telling us how he's fulfilling that promise. He is unfolding the promise to rescue the world from sin, to rescue us from death, hell, and the grave. And in Genesis chapter 17, he again speaks into that promise through Abraham. We get to watch him in his work of how he's doing this. And so there's a couple of things that I want you to see about the God who makes promises. I want you to see the reasons why. I want you to see the purposes why. I want you to see what our response is to be. But the very first thing that you need to see when we think about the promise-keeping God is simply this. God has the power to fulfill his promises. God has the power to actually do what he says he will do. Many times in our life, we will, as my mama says, bite off more than we can chew. We will make commitments. We will make promises, sometimes even with good intentions, but we're not able to deliver on our word. We're not able to finish the task. So we understand that when we hear promises, oftentimes in our world, we are leery that they will be fulfilled. We see this in the dishonesty about buying anything in the world. Have you tried to buy a house or a car lately? If you try to buy a house or a car and you don't have the money to pay for all of it up front, you have to sign over your life, your next born child, your third kidney, and your sixth toe in order to get the money. Do you know why you have to do all that? Well, it's because people don't keep their word. They don't fulfill their commitments. So when we think about the idea of making promises, we want to know that the one giving the promise will fulfill the promise. Look with me at the first verse. This is important for us to hear. When Abraham was 99 years old, now we need to understand that at the conclusion of chapter 16, 
Ishmael is born, the child he had out of the marriage of Sarah, but with the servant Gor Hagar, the child that was not promised to be the descendant, the one in which he schemed with his wife to go outside the will of the Lord. And so now 13 years have passed, 13 years since Ishmael has been born. Ishmael is a teenage son. Surely Abraham wished that he would be the heir, that he would be the one that would fulfill the promise. But God had said, no, it will come from Sarah. So now he's 99 years old. Almost 25 years, Abraham left his home, traveled across the desert, made it into the promised land on a promise where God would say, I'm going to give you offsprings and they're going to number the stars in the sky. And now 25 years later, at 99 years old, he still has not had one child with his wife, Sarah. I'm sure that he is growing weary. I'm sure that the window of nature has closed in their mind. I don't know about you, but if I were told I was going to be a father at 100 years old, I would go to Jesus at that very moment. 99 years old, and he's yet to experience the fulfillment of the promise. God had promised, and yet it has not taken place. But notice what God does. Look at verse 1. He says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, Now notice this phrase. I want you to get your pen ready. You need to underline this one. I am God Almighty. This is the first time in Scripture where this phrase is used. This is the first time in Scripture where God declares his name by saying, I am God Almighty. The phrase is El Shaddai. It is God who is powerful. It is God who is strong. It literally means the God who defies nature. The God who bends the will of science to what he desires and wants. He literally shows up to Abraham, a 99-year-old fatherless man to his wife Sarah, who he has promised a child to, and he says, Abram, I know you're worried, I know you're doubting, I know you're unsure, but remember this, I'm the God that nature listens to. I'm the God that bends the natural to my will. I'm the God that is not bound by your science or physics or biology. I am the God that sits over all of that. So when he begins to make these promises to Abram, he begins by stating all the promises that you are about to hear, I am more than capable of fulfilling. I am strong enough to handle all that I'm about to say to you. He has had names given to him prior to this. In chapter 14, he is referred to as El Elyon, the God who sees. In chapter 15, he is referred to as El Roja, the God who hears. But here he will pronounce himself as the God most high, the God who is all powerful. And think for just a moment, up until now in Genesis, what we have seen. We have seen a God in Genesis chapter 1 that speaks and the world is created, that is El Shaddai. We have seen a God who saw the world in wickedness and went to Noah and said, build a boat. I'm going to wipe the earth clean through the flood rains, but I'm going to save you out of them. That is the God Almighty. He bends the weather to his will. He rescues those in whom he desires. He punishes those in whom are deserved the justice and wrath of God. This is the God of who we see. We see him in Genesis chapter 11 come down on the Tower of Babel and scatter the nations abroad, confusing their languages. Why? Because he is God Almighty. He is the God who makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. He is the God in which the waves and the wind obey. He is the God who brings the dead back to life. Brothers and sisters, he is the God who hung on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and yet hell could not hold him and the grave could not keep him. He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. When he makes promises, you can be certain that he will fulfill them. He is God. And he is the God of the promise of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. Think about that for a moment. He's the God who promised to send his son And promised that if we believe in his son, we will have everlasting life. Did he not send his son? Of course he did. 
Did his son not die on the cross like he said he would? Of course he did. The Son of Man will be lifted up is what he said. Did he not get buried in the tomb that we should have gone into? Did he not lay cold and dead in the grave that we should have had? Of course he did. And on the third day, did he not shake loose from that tomb and blood begin to pour through his veins and air begin to fill his lungs and him declare to all who will listen, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is he not the God who promised to send his son and save sinners and did he not fulfill his promise? Of course he did. Why? Because he is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is God Almighty. He is about to tell Abraham, you're going to have children and nations. You're going to have kings. It's going to be an everlasting promise. And Abraham is thinking to himself, I am 99 years old. I am 99 years old. I'm 41 years old. My back hurts when I wake up in the morning. To a semi-nomad, tent-dwelling shepherd man in the desert of Canaan who is 99 years old without one heir with his wife. And God will show up and say, not only are you going to have an heir, but from you will come nations upon nations. And from you will come kings upon kings. And from you will be an everlasting generation and a covenant. From you will be all that I have promised and Abraham has to be floored because he's thinking to himself this is crazy until God says I am El Shaddai I am God Almighty I can do what I have promised to do might I for just a moment make an application to our lives how much peace would you have tomorrow if you woke up remembering that God fulfills every promise he gives How much worry and fret would be laid aside when you find yourself toiling over the uncertainty of life, when you stop to remember that God has made promises to you and he has promised to keep all of those and he will keep all of those because he is God Almighty. How much easier it is for us to think about the promises of God through Scripture and remember that he is not like us. He never fails. He will never let us down. He will always fulfill his word. How good it is to walk with a God who keeps his word. How good it is to know the Lord who holds his word and truth. How good it is to walk knowing that the God over all things, El Shaddai, God Almighty, will fulfill every single promise he has given us. What joy can fill our hearts. What worry can be cast away when we live knowing God will keep his word. Word. There's a second truth I want you to see from this text that helps us, and that's simply this. I want you to see that in God's promises, there's always purpose. And God has a purpose for why he promises. God has a purpose in his promises. He's not just making these up and just throwing things against the wall. He's not just guessing on what Abraham might want. He has a, a purpose for these. Look, look there in your text. Let's look at the verses 2 through 8. It says, that I will make my covenant between you and me and multitude and a multitude greatly. And you may multiply you greatly. Excuse me. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into a nation, and king shall come from you. Verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offsprings, and after you throughout their generations, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings after you. And I will give to you and to your offsprings after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. All along, God has been making promises to Abraham. He started in chapter 12 telling him, start walking towards a land that I will show you and and I'm going to make you a great nation. He does it again in chapter 15. I'm going to give you a son and may it be that you're going to be the father of a great nation. All along, God has been promising to Abraham. All along, God has been giving him his word of promise. But with every time God appears to Abraham, the promise gets a little more colored in. We get a little more array of what God is doing. We get a little more fuller picture of what's happening. Just think about it for a moment. In chapter 12, where the promise first starts, he looks at Abraham and he says, I'm going to give you the land that you see. So what your eyes can see, I'm going to give you. Now here in chapter 17, he brings that even fuller to say, I'm going to give you all of Canaan. I'm going to enlarge it. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to define it. In chapter 12, he says that you'll be a great nation. 
here, he says, not only are you going to be a great nation, you're going to be a multitude of nations, and from you, kings will come. You will be so big, and society will see you, that you will establish rule in places from your generations. He's enlarging the promise. He tells him that he will be a blessing and a curse to those who come against him in chapter 12. Here, he says, I will have my covenant to be your God for generation upon generation, an everlasting covenant. So in chapter 12, we have a little bit of the promise. And here in chapter 17, we have the promise more full. God is building in the purpose. Now the question is, why is God doing this? Why is God making these promises to Abraham? Why does Abraham need to be the father of nations? Why does Abraham need to be the father of kings? Why does Abraham need to have generation after generation and covenant after covenant? What is God doing in the purposes of these promises? Why is he leading Abraham this way? What is his goal here? Well, there's several things that we need to see. So if you will, just look with me at your word. The first thing is, is he says, I'm going to make you a, a father of nations. In fact, he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Now, this is kind of interesting because changing someone's name is a big deal. It's a big deal for someone to come up to you and say, hey, I, I've heard your name, but I'm going to change it. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. Next week in our services and even happening now, we have our parent-child dedication. Those moms and dads with those newborns are, are having breakfast this morning and meeting with our children's ministry team and, and learning about what it means to raise a child in the Lord. And, and next week we'll honor them and and I was just thinking to myself, what if they lined up across the stage and, and one of those babies was named Ben, and, and I, the pastor, pick up baby Ben and say, I really like that name, but from here on you're going to be called Samuel. Now I think those parents would probably have me flogged and run out of the church, right? Like that, That's not what you do. But God shows up and God has the sovereign authority to change the name of Abram, and he has the sovereign authority because he's doing something in his promise. He looks at Abram, and he says, I'm going to call you Abraham. And phonetically speaking, the way Abraham sounds in the Hebrew is a play on words for nations. It literally says there in your text, after he renames him, because you'll be the father of nations. So every time Abraham's name is called, it will be a, a hearing reminder that God has promised to make you the father of nations. That from you, the world will be populated, and these nations will go forth. So he's enlarging the promise. Now think about it for a moment. If you come up to someone and say, hey, by the way, you're going to be the father of nations, and from you will come kings, and God's going to be with you for every generation, and he will be your God, you have to be pretty big to fulfill that promise. You have to be El Shaddai if you're going to make that promise. It makes no sense naturally that this would happen. But he will tell him that kings will come from you. Well, God kept this promise. About a thousand years after Abraham will come the dynasty of David's kingdom. David will be the king of Israel. From Abraham's lineage will come the king. There will be a king. And we will talk in just a moment about the future prophecy past David into Jesus, but he kept his word. They will have the promised land. Joshua will move in after the time in slavery in Egypt, and they will conquer the promised land, and they will build up Canaan. God kept his word. God fulfilled his promise. He gave them the promised land. He gave them a king. He gave them land. He's been their God. They've been able to worship him even in exile. He kept his word. He did what he said he would do. It's an everlasting covenant. God had a purpose in all of this. The question is, what is the purpose? Well, brothers and sisters, this is where the Bible helps us understand that what Abraham knew and what we know is not necessarily the same thing. Because we have the luxury of looking back into the scripture from the other side of the cross. And so what we know that Abraham knew is that God was going to establish in him a nation. And God was going to bring kings. And God was going to fulfill his promises. What we know is that what God is doing through Abraham is all fulfilled in Christ. What we know is that God says, I'm going to make you nations through Christ. How do we know this? Because Revelation chapter 7 tells us, and I turned and saw a great multitude that no man can number from every nation, tribe, and tongue. In Christ, God kept his fulfillment to Abraham to gather in nations. And then he says, kings will come from you. About a thousand years after Abraham, David and Saul and Solomon set up the kingdom. About a thousand plus years after that, there comes one on Palm Sunday riding into Jerusalem who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords in which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. God kept his word. 
Not only did he promise to give him nations and a kings, but he promised to have an everlasting covenant with him. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, an heir to the promise. We are now in the nation covenant. Because of Christ, he has made a covenant that he is our God. And we are his people and he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. This is the promise that he's made, the purpose of his promise. He wasn't just promising Abraham a piece of dirt in the Middle East. He was promising rescue through Christ. This is the beauty of the story of Genesis, that God is doing what the author and the, and the character of Abraham could not even fully understand. But God is working. He has a purpose in his promise. And then it says, notice there in verse 8, you see the last phrase in verse 8? And I will be their God. They will be my people. This is God reconciling to himself sinners. This is God reconciling to himself those who are lost. This is God reconciling to himself those who have been cut off and put away. This is what we read in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, speaking of Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. You know how we get to be a part of the covenant of God? Christ Jesus. Think about it. Think about how wonderful this is. Way back, 6,000 plus years ago, God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to make nations come from you. I'm going to make kings come from you. And I'm going to reconcile people to myself. I'm going to be their God forever. And 6,000 years later, those of us who are in Christ are watching feeling, experiencing the fulfillment of the promise that El Shaddai gave to Abraham centuries ago. What a God! What a wonderful, matchless, miraculous, powerful God! And why is it so good for us to study this Old Testament and see this unfolding and hear this Bible lesson? Because tomorrow when I wake up and I'm doubting God, I am reminded that he is the God who kept his promise to Abraham. He is the God who sent the king of kings that he promised. He is the God that has secured for us an eternal land. And it's not just Canaan on the map in Israel. No, brothers and sisters, it is what John saw in Revelation, for I saw a new heaven and a new earth and Jerusalem coming down. It is the city of Zion we are marching towards. He promised it to Abraham. He fulfilled it in Christ. And now tomorrow, whatever the world may throw at me, it will be okay because El Shaddai keeps his word. Amen. This is the beauty of the God of Genesis. It may seem like old stories. It may seem like fairy tale long ago, but it's true and it's right and it's good and it reminds us that God keeps his word. So think about it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. God keeps his word. You will never leave me nor forsake me. God keeps his word. You'll be my witnesses and you'll have my power. God keeps his word. I will bind up the brokenhearted. God keeps his word. God keeps his word. This is the beauty of the promises of God, that he has purpose and what he does. Let's close with this last and final thought. And that's simply this. God has the priorities for us when we respond to his promises. Everything up until now has been God. In fact, if you look at verse 1 and verse 2, notice there in verse 2 it says, and he gave a covenant or he made a covenant. You realize that all the work is on God's side of this promise, right? I'll make you a nation. I'll give kings from you. I'll give you a land. I'll make you an eternal people. I'll be your God. All the work's on God's shoulders. He doesn't come to Abraham and says, well, if you try hard enough, if you work hard enough, if you pay enough money, I'll be your God and I'll give you Canaan land. That's not what he says. He says, I will do this. All the work is on God's side. This is the story of the gospel. The gospel is the grace and mercy of God that he does it all. But what we find in the story of the gospel, we find here in Genesis 17, that there is a response required to the promises of God. There is a faith required to the promises of God. Let me show you what I mean. Look there in verse 2. It says in verse 2, that I may make a covenant between me and you, and I may, or excuse me, I'm sorry, 
Look at verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Now verse 2. That I may make a covenant between me and you, and that I may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him. I want you to notice here that there are some responses that we are to have to the promises of God. When we see and read and hear in God's word his promises, when you're studying your scriptures and you come across a promise of God, there is a response of faith that is necessary. The promises of God are true and right, and you don't do anything to earn them or activate them or cause him to do them. By his grace, he's promised. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is grace given and faith required. We are to believe in his promises. Notice there in verse 1 what it says. Here is the requirement of the one who has heard and received the promises of God. They are to walk before the Lord. It says, literally, be blameless and walk before me. Do you know what this means? This means that a person who has heard the promises of God and believed the promises of God, here's what faith looks like. Faith is waking each day and remembering God has done this, God has said this, God will fulfill his word, therefore I will walk every day with my eyes on him. I will make every decision knowing that I am confidently settled in the promises that he's given me. I will make every scheme of man fall away and listen solely to the Lord because I want to walk in his promises. Faith is seeing what God has done and then obeying him because of it. He is walking now this way. So what does this look like? It means simply this, living a life that believes the Lord. That believes the Lord. Anytime you find yourself in sin, you have decided not to believe the Lord. You have decided that his word is not true, that your way is better. You have decided that the, the consequences of sin don't matter. We have determined that God's word is not true. So what he says here is, if you believe me, if you know I will do this, then walk before me. Not only that, look at verse 3. He says in verse 3, Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, I believe that one who comes to the worship of God when we hear his promises. And when you hear a promise of God, when you study the promises of God in Scripture, you are to obey him, believe him, trust him, and worship him. Not only are you to worship him, but you are to live in obedience of him. Now let us close by looking at this idea of circumcision. Look with me at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenants. And your offspring after you throughout the generations. This is the covenant which you shall keep between, uh, between me and you and your offsprings. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between you and me. Or me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations. So now the Lord says, here's what I require. I'm giving you all these promises. You're going to have a land, nations, king. I'm going to be your God. We're going to reconcile. We're going to always be together. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. I'm going to always hold on to you. But the symbol and the sign that you have heard me and you trust me and you obey me and you believe me is circumcision now in the male line. Now, there's a lot of reasons for circumcision in the scripture. There's a lot of understanding of why this would be the sign. But ultimately... Let's just be mindful of, like I put a ring on my hand to remind me of marriage, circumcision was a way that obedience was to be reminded to the head of the household and down through it that they have accepted the promises of God and they believed him. They would look nowhere else for their answers. They would look only to God. Just as every day I see the ring on my finger, every day the Hebrew male would see his circumcised skin and understand that he is to walk in obedience with God. That he is to obey him and follow him and trust him and believe him and walk blamelessly before him. It was a bodily reminder of the promise giving God and that he would keep his promise. It was to serve as a marker that they would never leave his way. And God is so serious about it that if you go down to the end of the chapter, it literally says that Abraham, verse 22, Abraham immediately circumcised himself and Ishmael and all the people in his village. This is a 99-year-old man that believed God so much that he circumcised himself, his 13-year-old son, and every other male in the Hebrew. And in fact, look there in verse 14. 
It was so serious to God, this sign of the covenant, that he said, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. Literally. It's as if we take the wedding ring off to go against our marriage vows. He says, if you don't do this, you are declaring you don't believe me, you don't trust me, you won't follow me, you don't think I can really fulfill my promises. This was the symbol and the sign. Now the question is, why circumcision? Well, circumcision was already practiced in the ancient world. We have literature that tells us the Egyptians practiced it, though they practiced it for worship of their fertility gods. They practiced it as a rite of passage moving into marriage. But God redeemed this in the sense of now it will be a sign for the men, the leaders of the home, to remember that in every day when they see themselves, they are to remind themselves that they are walking in obedience with the Lord. And the question will be is how does this play out? Well, circumcision becomes very clearly the symbolism of spiritualism in the Bible. We find in Jeremiah 4.4 the warning of people's hearts. It says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah, your inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest the wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Through scripture, circumcision begins to uh, become the symbol of one who obeys the Lord and one who is to not. Oftentimes in the New Testament, we hear the idea that those who are uncircumcised are heathens or sinners. This is a slang term and a symbolism of the idea that those who practice circumcision love the Lord. So it becomes a heart issue. In fact, God will go on in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4, to prompt, excuse me, verse 6. He says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. He literally says, it's not about the foreskin of the male organ. It's about your heart being right before God and that you need circumcision of your heart in order to obey him. This is the story of salvation, that we believe the promises of God, we believe he is true, and we turn our hearts towards him. In fact, if you have your Bible open, I want to close with Colossians. Take it and turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. I want you to see this very argument that is made of Christ. That the sign and the symbol of this very argument is given to us in Christ. Colossians Chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You, who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcised of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The Apostle Paul literally takes the writing of God in Genesis chapter 17. And he says, God first gave circumcision to the males as a physical reminder that God is the God who will save you if you believe in his promises. Then he gets to the New Testament. He says, we no longer need the ritual of cutting away the foreskin. It was a symbol to lead us to the idea that we need our heart to be cut away. We need our sin to be cut away. We need salvation. We need rescuing. We need a transformation. So he will go to Christ and he would say, this is what happened. Christ in his whole body, was the symbol of circumcision for us. He went to the cross being cut away, bloody, and tortured, so that we, our body, might be redeemed. The foreskin of the curse of sin laid on Christ, and he was cut away so that we might be rescued. Our hearts now are made pure because of Christ. Christ did this for us. Christ rescued us. Christ is the fulfillment of the promise of Genesis chapter 17. And now the symbolism moves from uh, circumcision to baptism. We come to Christ and we are baptized. It's open now, not just to males, but to males and females. It's for all to come under the symbol of God because Christ has done this for us. You cannot read Genesis chapter 17 and not see the gospel. You cannot read Genesis chapter 17 and not see a God who keeps his word. 
This is the God we serve. The God who promised thousands of years before Jesus. That I will send a king. And I will send him to the cross. And he will die for you so that your hearts, not your male organs, but your hearts will be crucified and the sin will be cut away. And you will be rescued. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God of promise. So 19 years old, I popped a question to my wife. We've been married 21 years. August will be 22 years, best 22 years of her life, of course. <clears throat> and, and, and I understand, and, and I don't mean this to sound sad or, or pitiful or anything like that, but, but there's coming a day where our marriage will come to an end in the glory of heaven. One of us will pass away, the Lord will return, and, and in heaven it will be different. It will be a different kind of, of living. So eventually the, the ring will come off. That promise will be fulfilled. But what God does with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, and what he has fulfilled through Christ, he is reminding us that the circumcision of the heart by the Savior will never come off. It will never be lost. It will never go away. It will never be a promise that will be fulfilled and you move on. It is always fulfilled for all of eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ because God made a promise in Genesis 17, I will be your God, an everlasting covenant. And so there is coming a day because of the circumcision of Christ to resurrect our dead hearts and save us that we will be married to the groom for all eternity. Oh, brothers and sisters, I pray this morning that you know the God who keeps his promises. Would you bow your heads? Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us online. It is so great that through technology you were able to join us today. I hope while you got to sing with God's people and hear his word preached, you were moved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Maybe while you were worshiping with us online, the Lord began to prompt your heart. Maybe he's calling you to make some sort of decision or follow him in a more tangible way. Or maybe you just realize you need some help and you want some other people to come along beside you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If that's the case, we want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to tell you that we're a church that's here for you. There are two ways that you can contact us. First, you can click on the link in this post above the video and you'll find all kinds of ways to hear more about who we are, fill out a contact information, or put in a prayer request. Or if you'd like to, you can email the email that's coming across the screen now, prayer at brushycreek.org. If you send an email to that address, it will get to our staff, and we'll be glad to return it, to pray for you, and to care about you. It is so neat to be able to worship together from all over the world. We would love for you to come join us in person sometime, but until then, we hope to meet you here again next week.